Good morning, class. Good morning, Brother Keith. Hi, I'm Keith Moore, and we welcome you to Faith School. Faith School's the place where my spirit is fed, where my faith grows stronger, and where I learn how to be an overcomer. Our spirits, uh, our bodies are actually patterned after our spirits and the same principles apply that if you don't feed your body, it'll get weak. It won't have strength. And so your spirit has to be fed too. And Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. And so when your spirit is weak, everything just seems hopeless. The smallest things can just seem unreachable impossible. It'd be like physical strength. If you are so weak, you know, you can't even sit up, then the smallest tasks would just be beyond you, you know, brushing your teeth, combing your hair. You, well, if you can't get out of bed, that's, that seems impossible. But when you're strong, these things seem easy. They're like normal. And so the same thing is true with your spirit. Sadly, many people's uh, spirits are not being fed. And uh, many people don't go to church. They don't read their Bible. They don't pray. They never look at the Word for answers. And even some that do go to church, if all you hear is religion and tradition and, you know, politics and social reform, that will not build you up in faith. In fact, it can tear you down. Some things, instead of feeding faith, they feed fear. And so sometimes folks have lived year after year, even decade after decade, just barely surviving, just feeling so hopeless and helpless and a victim to everything. But that's not who God made us to be. He made us to be overcomers. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He made us to be more than conquerors through him that loved us. Now, if you're not a child of God, you don't have access to what we're talking about here. So you ought to become a child of God <laughs> right away. But everybody said out loud, I am a child of God. I am a child of God. And the greater one lives in me. And the greater one lives in me. And he makes me strong. And he makes me strong. To overcome. To overcome. I'm an overcomer. I am overcomer. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That, that, that's another way of saying you're a winner. You are a winner. Whether you've been acting like it or not, if you're a child of God, that's what you are. That's your nature on the inside. So let's feed that spirit. Let's build up that nature and let it uh, rise up and overcome and dominate the problems in this life. Can you say amen? amen? Well, Father, all of us agree together today as touching this, asking you for the anointing, asking you for the utterance, asking you for the ears to hear, answers right now where you know we need them. And we'll give you the praise and thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. Thank you, Lord. Would you look please in the scriptures to our main text that we've been looking at for weeks now, Hebrews chapter 3. And then also 1 Corinthians 10, Hebrews 3 and 1 Corinthians 10. In Hebrews 3, uh, the scripture said in verse 7, it says, Wherefore, as the Holy Spirit says today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. Now we've, we've seen the, uh, already that first generation of Israelites that the Lord brought out of Egyptian bondage failed to trust Him, failed to believe Him, failed to obey Him. And here it says in the New Testament, here it says, they tempted me. Another uh, uh, definition of that word is tested. And he, he goes on to say, and, and proved me. So it's that same, they tried him, they tried his patience, they, uh, you know, they kept saying, you know, God's going to kill us out here, and, 
and we're all going to die out here. And, and he's, they're tempting him to let them, leave them to themselves. And they are, they're trying to prove him. And we're going to see that as we, we get into this, uh, the, these accounts. They would say things like, can God do this? Or can God do that? Imagining that they are trying to get God to prove himself to them. Big mistake. I said big mistake because God wasn't on trial. <laughs> it was them. <laughs> it was them, their faith that was being tested. And they were failing the test left and right. And so you don't want to get it in your mind, will God prove to me this or prove to me that? Uh, you even hear people so foolishly say, well, there's, there's no proof of the existence of God. Uh, yeah, just like everything around you, you, the earth you're standing on, the air you're breathing, the fact that you exist. The Bible said that we see his wisdom and even the very Godhead revealed in his creation. Proof of God is all around you. It's everywhere. The material universe and, and yet people still, they're like, well, God proved to me this, proved to me that. He has proven his love for us. He sent Jesus. Jesus has proven to us his commitment to us. He gave it all, spirit, soul, body. He ever lives to make intercession for us. God's not on trial. Are you all with me? He's already proven it. It's us that have something to prove. Will we believe? Will we trust Him? Will we listen to Him? Will we be faithful? He is ever faithful. And we need to demonstrate that we have faith and are faithful. It goes on to say, verse 10, I was grieved with that generation and said, they do always err in their hearts and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they'll not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. So he warns us not to be like they were. In 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, you'll see the same thing, similar idea. 1 Corinthians 10, 1, he says, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat or food, and did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that, uh, actually the margin says, went with them, and that rock was Christ. And what we're seeing is that everything that happened to them was a graphic uh, prophecy and a graphic representation of Christ and redemption and everything we have in, in Him. Canaan's land is a type of our, uh, the rich blessings and benefits that we have in this new and better covenant. And so he goes on to say, he said, but with many of them, God was not well pleased. They were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things are our examples, examples to us, to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they lusted. Don't be idolaters as were some of them. Verse 8, don't commit fornication as some of them. Verse 9, don't tempt Christ as some of them. Verse 10, neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happen to them for in samples or examples or types, and they're written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. So we have begun going back to these uh, situations where they fail the test to believe God because we want to do exactly what the New Testament says and, and be forewarned, forearmed by this knowledge, by this understanding. There are examples lifted in the Word of God Examples to be like and follow, and examples not to be like and follow. 
And you need to know the ones what not to do. A lot of times you'll learn what something is by learning what it's not as well. So go back with me to Exodus, the 14th chapter, and we've already uh, covered the first one. By the time the account reaches over in Numbers, the 14th chapter, there were 10 separate episodes or events where they failed to believe God. And uh, the first one was at the Red Sea in chapter 14 here of uh, Exodus. And so we're taking them one at a time, one of, the, of these 10, and looking at them. And so at the Red Sea, uh, we're also, as we're doing this, we're making a list of the characteristics of unbelief so that we keep in mind that when we notice any of these, we resist it. We don't give place to it. Uh, we don't allow ourselves to go that direction. One of the big ones that you see in this first account at the Red Sea, when they heard and saw Pharaoh's armies coming, it says they, they were sore afraid. They, they got full of fear and, and they just yielded to full-blown panic. Fear is a perversion of faith and it is an evil thing. It is a very, very destructive thing and to yield to fear and act on fear gives the enemy access and a right to destroy in your life. And, and there is a, a law and a principle that the things that you fear would come to you and come on you. And, and most of the world doesn't know this at all, or if they hear it, they wouldn't even believe it. But these spiritual principles are real, and they work, whether you believe them or not, like the law of gravity. It doesn't matter. You jump off the house, if you're old, you go down. If you're young, you go down. <laughs> Educated, you go down. If you say, well, I don't believe in the law of gravity, jump and see what happens. I mean, it's going to work whether you believe it, whether you think it's right or not, whether you believe it's real or not. And so this thing about fear, fear is something that all believers should treat as absolute spiritual contraband. By that, I mean, we can't have that in our lives. Now, you will be tempted to fear. Oh, yeah, you will. There will be times when uh, feelings of fear, thoughts of fear will just, will just come on you and just try to sit on you. And, and it, it can surprise you sometimes uh, that fear will just hit you. But what you've got to realize is that's an attack on your person from the outside, and even though you might feel very afraid, you have not lost the battle. You are in the battle. <laughs> Come on, can you see this? You, you don't say, oh, well, I feel so afraid, so I'm already afraid, I've already lost. No, no, now is the time when you resist that fear. And you say, no, you don't, no, you don't. Fear, I resist you. Fear, get out of here. And, and, and it'll have to obey Amen. that mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. It'll have to obey. So fear is the opposite of faith. And just like acting in faith gives God his spirit access to manifest in your life. That's how you get miracles. Well, acting on fear is how the enemy gets access. And that's how destruction and terrible things can happen. So when they saw and heard Pharaoh coming and they're up against the Red Sea, uh, you would be tempted to fear. You know, I don't care who you were. You would be tempted to fear, but that's when you got to get a hold of yourself and go, no, no. Now God's bigger than Pharaoh's army, right? You got to talk to yourself. God's bigger than Pharaoh's army. And if he got, they had just seen 10 signs and wonders, right? Yes. Um, astounding things that nobody had ever heard of before. They'd seen it. They'd witnessed it. They'd lived through it. So shouldn't by now, after 10 signs and wonders, shouldn't you begin to have an inclination to think, well, God could do it again, Amen. right? Yes. Shouldn't you at least begin to lean that way? And the Lord kept waiting for them to show some signs of this, of trust me. Look what I've already done. Believe me. Expect me. But 
every time, every time, they just slide back in to the fear and the panic, and, they, and, and then they'd start blaming other people, usually Moses. <laughs> Moses and Aaron. They're like, Moses, why'd you bring us out of Egypt? Is it because there were no graves over there? You brought us all to die in the wilderness? Blaming others, so negative. Now, why am I going over these things like this? Do we want to identify unbelief? Do we want to see it afar off, right? And, and go, oh no, no, I'm not talking like that. No, I'm not yielding to that. I'm not letting that in me. Why? Because unbelief is a thief. It robbed them of Canaan's land. And all manner of things they should have enjoyed. They should have had a good life and a long life and a fruitful life. In Canaan's land, in their own houses they didn't build, in their own vineyards and orchards they didn't plant, and with their own flocks. Instead, wandering around in a dry, bleak desert, complaining. And it wasn't God's choice. That was their choice. They chose that instead of Canaan's land because they chose to doubt instead of believe. Somebody say, by the grace of God, by the grace of God not, me. not me. I will not doubt my God. I will trust my God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It, it's, and it's not optional. Uh, the Lord said, you know, Without faith, in Hebrews 11, it is impossible to please Him. For they that come to Him must. Everybody say must. must. See, must, must is not optional. Not you should, not you could. Must believe that He is, and you must believe that He's a good God. He's a rewarder of those that seek Him. You reach out to Him, you say, Lord, I'm trusting in you. You can count on him. Amen. He hears. Yes. He responds. Yes. Right? Amen. But something else you can count on too. If you're going to reject him, if you're going to doubt him, if you're going to yield to fear and say there's no way we're all going to die out here, then that's what's going to happen. You forfeit God's help when you choose to doubt. I don't want to do that. All right? You don't want to do that. By the grace of God, we won't. So we saw in Exodus 14 that they got off to a really bad start. But God, in His mercy, He delivered them anyway because He wanted to demonstrate His power. It wasn't because of their faith. It was just because of His mercy. We'll see that in Scripture as, as we study these things. But in Exodus uh, 14, at the end there, when, uh, well, let's read verse 30. After he had uh, split the Red Sea, they all got across safely, and then the Red Sea closed, and all of Pharaoh's army perished and drowned. Verse 30, thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. And Israel saw, notice how it keeps emphasizing, they saw it. They saw it. They saw that great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians. And the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. The man, you ought to put a star by that and underline it and highlight it because it is a brief, bright moment <laughs> in this story that they actually believed God for about that long. They did, though. But, like we were talking last week, it's a result of them seeing this astounding miracle after they saw the miracle. And there's no threat. Then they're like, yeah, let's have a meeting. <laughs> let's rejoice. And so we read in uh, the 15th chapter that most of that chapter is a, a song celebrating. I will sing unto the Lord 
for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and rider, he's thrown into the sea. And then they, they, they sang about how big God is. And, and they sang about the great victory over Egypt and their enemies. It's not going to bother them anymore. They sang about how the fear of God is going to be falling on the Philistines and the Moabites and everybody where they're going. And how they're going to make it in. And how God's dwelling place will be there. And it's just glorious and Miriam grabbed a tambourine and they all got to playing and singing. Man, they're having a meeting. They're having a meeting. They're having a hallelujah time. They're actually believing in God that he can do it and that Moses is actually hearing from God and leading them. Really? Now, you were laughing, but just a few verses before, they, they're saying, why didn't you leave us in Egypt? Why did you bring us out here? But it was after they saw and after the threat is gone and the pressure is off. You know, anybody can rejoice <laughs> and say, I believe God. When the bills are all paid, body's healed, you feel good. No threat, no pressure, no challenge. But notice in the, uh, at the end of the book here, verse uh, 22, so Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days, everybody say three days, three days in the wilderness, and they found no water. Uh-oh. They found no water. Now, is that surprising out in the desert that you, <laughs> that you couldn't find any water? Now, the reason I say this is because you're going to see this same, exact same scenario Again and again and again in these next, you know, eight past this episodes about the water. Very same scenario. And it's not shocking because they are in the desert. And they are a massive group of people. People, you know, historians estimate at least two million people. It might have been closer to three. And they got all their flocks with them. And their herds, they need an enormous amount of water every day just to survive. But when there's no water, like we, we, we said last week, this is a challenge. But every challenge is an opportunity to demonstrate faith. Say it out loud, class. Every challenge, every challenge. is an opportunity. To demonstrate faith. Could they know how God would take care of them? No, that's too big for them. That's beyond them. On this occasion, he turned the bitter waters sweet. Who would have thought that would happen? On another occasion, he brought water out of the rock. He did that more than once. Who could have imagined that's how he would do it? No, you, you can't fathom and figure out uh, and, you know, forecast exactly what God's going to do. But you can trust His love for you. You can trust His ability. Amen. Right? Yeah. You can trust His wisdom. You can trust His plan. You can trust His care for you. And that's a choice that you make in your heart. Every time you encounter a challenge... What's going on here? It's an opportunity, right? For me to demonstrate that I know in whom I have believed. And I am persuaded. Oh, somebody say persuaded. I'm persuaded that he is able. He's able to keep what I've committed to him. Well, what if you don't commit it to him? Well, he's, is he able to keep what you don't commit to him or what you pull back and pull away. No, you, you've got to roll your cares over on him. You've got to commit things to him and trust him. Have they seen miracles? They've seen those ten mighty signs and wonders. Now they've seen another one with the splitting of the Red Sea. They've seen things nobody's ever heard about. Couldn't it have the possibility have crossed their mind God can get us water or get us to where water is, you know, don't you think that at least possibility would cross their mind? But see, they chose not to be positive. 
They chose instead, back into the same thing, they, they found no water, and they came to Marah, and there was water there. I'm sure they all got excited, but they couldn't drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. And therefore the name of it was called Marah, or, which means bitterness. And the people did what? Said, well, God's got us this far. He can get us the rest of the way. <laughs> huh? huh? Nothing's too hard for God. Huh? Nothing's impossible. <laughs> That's what you want to hear them say. Right? Because you, you, we know the rest of the story. And you so much want to say, hmm, quit that. Stop that. Show God you trust Him. Show God you believe in Him. You don't have to know everything. All you got to do is make a decision that you trust your God. But no, what they do? Murmured against Moses saying, what are we going to drink? Back to that panicky, blaming, disrespectful, unthankful, unbelieving. Well, the more I talk about it, the more I dislike it. Huh? You feel the same way? Well, does God dislike unbelief? Oh, it, it bothers him. He, he feels quite strongly about unbelief and fear. You and I need to be in agreement with him that we despise unbelief. We detest doubt. Why? Because there is no reason. There is no reasonable uh, excuse for doubting a God who has never failed and who never will fail. Who has never lied and never will. There's no excuse for that. Say it out loud. Lord, Lord I, trust I trust you. I trust you. In life. In, life, in, death, in death. Past this life. Past this life I, will always I will always trust in you. Trust in for you are faithful. You are faithful. faithful and good. And good. My God. My I trust you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, praise God. And our time's up for today. Let's say it like we do sometimes. I live by faith. I walk by faith. I overcome this world by faith. I am strong in faith, giving glory to God. Amen and amen. Well, Come back next time. There's a lot more to see here in Faith School. I've got the victory living inside. Thank you for joining us at Faith School. Class is dismissed for today, but you can watch this and other episodes of Faith School free of charge at faithschool.org. For more information, visit our website or call us at 941-702-7390. 